This is the gentleman who uh, we should be talking about a little bit this afternoon, Oliver Cromwell. The interesting thing is that uh, in actual fact, I think everyone in this room has actually used some of actual words traceable to Oliver Cromwell during the past 12 months. I put that as a challenge to every one of you. Now, that's probably a little bit surprising, but I think when I tell you what those words are, you might agree. Because when Oliver Cromwell told his painter to paint his face, he said and issued the instruction, warts and all. So that's where that expression comes from. And uh, when you look at his physiognomy, I think you can, even though it's not that clear, you can see that that's what it was. So that's the situation, that's the person uh, that we're going to talk about, warts and all. Now what I'm going to do, there are really three sort of starts to what I want to say, and here's, this is the first beginning. It starts in what I can call Hopton and Cromwell, in other words. Now we here are now obviously in Stafford, and we're quite close to this particular uh, battle of Hopton Heath, but anyone who's uh, seeing this or listening elsewhere, it would apply equally to them, because during the English Civil War period, there were a number of battles, and wherever you are, you would be able to go and find some of these remains and think of what had happened in other times, as it were. Now, as far as we're concerned, um, Oliver Cromwell and the Jews, well, if we walk outside and go up the main road here, and there's a map and we can find it, and within a couple of miles uh, we can find where this uh, Battle of Hopton Heath took place. There's the sign which says it, it was fought here, and that was the 19th of March, 1643. So that's where this battle that I want to talk about has the first stage of our introduction to our subject this afternoon. And actually the outcome of that particular fight was indeterminate. Now what was happening there for us who don't know much about what was happening in those days, what had happened was that the parliamentarians fell out with the royalists, with the actually King Charles I, and there was a sort of a, an ongoing position which then ended up in a civil war where both sides fought each other, and this one in Hopton Heath ended up with the Royalists a sort of an indeterminate win as it stood there. So that's what happened. It was a big a battle which, uh, in which people were killed, uh, and um, although it was indeterminable, the outcome, uh, Cromwell, during his time, was in fact involved in this. And what I wanted to highlight is the fact that during this time, uh, L. Cromwell was carrying out important negotiations elsewhere. So as well as fighting the battles, and this is the background to this, because the Jews, about which he was spending a lot of time negotiating, had been expelled from England in 1290. Now, Cromwell had taken an interest in them. Now, he was actively attempting for purposes of having them back in the country for purposes of doing trade with them. So he was trying to get Jews to come back to help to build up the trade of the, com of the country, to re readmit them into England. So that was one, one of his um, powerful reasons Whilst the battles were taking place, he was trying to strengthen the, the economy, as it were. It was generally recognised in those days, and funny, well not funny enough, but it always has been. If you can get some um, Jews into the place, the international trade and so on and so forth goes on so much better. And Cromwell was uh, understanding that, and he was trying to do that. So therefore, a strong Jewish presence in England would be beneficial. So that was one of the reasons that he wanted the Jews uh, to come into the country. Now let's just do a little, having done that introduction, just a little bit about Cromwell himself. He was born in 1599 in Cambridgeshire. He was married at 1620, uh, in 1620. <coughs> Altogether he had nine children. Uh, not all of them survived. He became an MP in 1628. And it's from 1629 onwards that marks the beginning of discord in Parliament between the parliamentarians and the King Charles I. 
Now the point is about King Charles I, he believed in what was called the divine right of kings. He, he thought that he was put there, he was placed there by God, and he had every right to do just what he wanted to. And there, were, there was Parliament who were struggling with people to, to try to get the will of the people coming forward in that. Now that's a long way from today because we, we have a Queen who very well knows her place and, and keeps to it and, and there's not many problems about that. But that was a difficulty, and from 1629 onwards, there was a discord in Parliament between the parliamentarians and, and this King Charles, and this is what is the background of these battles in so on. Now, in 1630, uh, Oliver Cromwell became a Puritan. Now, a Puritan was a category of people who really emerged around the, the time of, of um, Henry VIII, now you remember Henry VIII, or you will have heard that Henry VIII broke from Rome and he set up his own uh, English church, uh, but there were a number of people in the country who were dissatisfied with that because they didn't feel that he had broken away enough from what the Pope was wanting them to do, which had been, the Pope had really been in control in previous ages. So the Puritans had their own agenda, as it were, and they were trying to purify the, the teaching and so on of the church and the general background of the country. Uh, and Oliver Cromwell became associated with them, and he called himself, as a result of this, a servant of God. So that was one of the sides that, that came out. Now, his further background, in 1642, it came to a head with King Charles, and he refused to give up control of the army, because obviously in this sort of battle, the army is, is uh, right centre to all of those things. And so therefore, he refused to do that, and uh, by August the 22nd, 1642, the English Civil War commenced with a small encounter between those forces, many of them uh, being close to this uh, Hopton Heath that we're very close to ourselves. So that was the beginning of it. By 1649, so that, those battles went on for something like seven years, the High Court of Justice found Charles I, who was the king, guilty of high treason, and subsequently he was, uh, he was beheaded, and Cromwell giving his, his agreement to that. So England was now in a position uh, of not having a, a king, and in fact uh, what happened was that uh, 1653 to 1658 Cromwell became what he was called the first Lord Protector of the Commonwealth. We've got to be careful with this because this word Commonwealth at this time isn't what we now talk about the Commonwealth with all the foreign countries, but the Commonwealth at that time was England, Scotland and Ireland with similar powers to those of a monarch. And that's what he became an extremely uh, senior person. And to take it right through, in 1658, Cromwell dies, reportedly, of, of malaria. So that's the sort of time scale uh, that we are looking at. So, in these negotiations that he was carrying out, not only with the Jews in terms of getting them here for that particular purpose, but the amazing thing, the second motivator that uh, Oliver Cromwell had was he wanted to bring the Jews to Britain because he had an expectation that conversion of the Jews would coincide with the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That was the real thing. Having taken on this, this uh, business of, of wanting the country to become more godly, he and a number of people with him were really believing in the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now that is an astonishing turn, uh, and it meant to say that it indeed was felt necessary for this to take place, for the Jews uh, to be converted, in fact, before Christ would return to reign on earth. In other words, he saw it that, that by getting them into the country and by them being converted and acknowledging it, then that would then lead to the return of Jesus Christ. Put it the other way around. If that didn't happen, then Jesus Christ wouldn't return. That was what they thought. Those... Cromwell and those close to him believed the Jews would return and acknowledge their Messiah and live in peace because they saw the ideas of a kingdom from the Bible that they looked at. 
And some of the Jews themselves, having been scattered throughout the world, believed that they would be regathered and led to Zion. So there was, a, there was quite a belief there. And I think it's appropriate to say that really at this time, in the sort of 1650s, the late 17th century, um, there was a sort of maelstrom of all sorts of ideas. Because you've got, for one thing, you've got the new church, which is being brought in by Henry VIII. Uh, you've got the Roman Catholics, who are still there doing their various things. Uh, you've got the Bible itself having become printed after the Reformation, about the 1640s. Um, so that there were copies of the Bible actually available that people themselves could read. And they were, there were also a number of people with these ideas having seen something about the future. Um, for example, there was also a group called the Fifth Monarchists. I'll mention that again in a minute. They think, well, whatever would that be? Well, well in actual fact, they were people who, having seen that and determined Daniel's image and the four metals of Daniel's image, and the fifth kingdom it was yet to be, the fifth monarchists believed that they were forming that fifth world empire. So, so it, we're showing people here at this time uh, who are really reading their scriptures in a, in a fairly haphazard sort of way, without an awful lot of structure about it, and coming to these sorts of conclusions and feeling that something was going to happen. And that was fairly widespread. Uh, in, in the people at that time. So, there was a sizable group with Comma called Fifth Monarchists, and their expectation was based through Bible reading. And that's the point, they read these things in the Bible. Now, it's an interesting question to ask, well, we have got the Bible available to all of us, there's more Bibles and in, and in more different uh, abilities of learning language than, than ever. Uh, we don't see that eagerness of reading and, and transferring that expectation round us today at all, but it certainly was very, very clear as far as they were concerned in those days. So, the characteristics of these Puritans, that they're looking for pur purity. And I might mention that, in fact, when the uh, American settlers went out on the Mayflower, they were Puritans, and, and they also were looking for pure religion, which they didn't feel they were having under the Roman Catholic regime. So there was a tremendous drive to, to change things in society. They read and believed the scriptures. Their convictions guided their life decisions. And, and the Bible and these, these ideas really meant something to them. We could all learn a lesson from that. Cromwell even actually stopped Christmas when he was in control. Christmas that was actually banned because he said that was, that was unexpected and uncalled for. Uh, from as far as the Catholics were concerned. So they would go to all sorts of lengths to try to live a more holy life. And in fact, he thought that others may have freedom to exercise their own conscience. That's, that was one of the things he wanted to do. And when he was dying, on conscience grounds, Cromwell refused the medicine which would have saved his life, which is a terrific thing. Now, the little association with that is that in actual fact, some Roman Catholics... Uh, had discovered some special bark, which they called Jesuit bark, which actually was able uh, to cure this terrible disease. Um, and it is still used today for that purpose. But Cromwell wouldn't have anything to do with popery. He was trying to be this purity. So in the middle of all these things, a country was being run, and there were battles going on, and indeed... Uh, Cromwell, not only in this country, with the sorts of battle we're talking about, but also in Scotland and uh, in uh, um, Ireland, did battles. So there was a whole lot of battles going on in the middle of all of these things, which I can only make slight reference to. And some of the battles were reported to be brutal. So he's, he's not a person that was always doing soft things, and some of the things he did were, were very difficult. So that's my first beginning. So you've got a people there who were looking very much at what the Bible was saying and prepared to do things about it. Now, my second beginning, I'm going to look at the Bible itself because these people were looking for a kingdom, a second coming of the Lord. Now, the life of the Lord Jesus teaching his disciples, 
then what did he say about it? Well, as far as he was concerned, he said to his disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The gospel, the good news. And also, after John was put in prison, Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. So often people talk about the gospel as if it's, well, that's Matthew, Mark, Luke or John. But in fact, it was the gospel of something, the good news of of something and that was the kingdom of God so that is the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ they were looking for that and of course these people in the 16th 17th century that's really what they were looking for and of course when Jesus was taken up into heaven Acts chapter 1 says when they therefore come together they asked him saying Lord wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel so there was this thought about a kingdom and Israel and, and restoration is this the time? And that's, that is the big question that they had. Now, you might say, well, why ask about re being restored? Because that's what the disciples asked for. And uh, we can just quote what Jesus said, as the angels said when he was taken up into heaven. And while the disciples looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, the whole two men stood by which said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. So these are straightforward words which people of all things through the ages have had a chance to read and to understand, and that's uh, what they were doing at this stage. That's what the Bible says. And what about restoring? Well, in the Old Testament, and they were very familiar with these passages, in, as we already know from Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, they knew about that, um, and Daniel says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, etc. So this idea of restoring things and rebuilding things, in other words, the whole idea that it's part way through and things are yet to happen. This was being certainly reflected as far as these people who were with uh, Oliver Cromwell at that stage is concerned. So that's our second beginning, to look at what the Bible says about it. These people are looking and, and reporting what it said. My second beginning is about what the Bible itself actually said. And of course, I'm just quoting a few quotes, but they are typical and they're not one-offs. And we could, report, we could add to that scores of times. So, what we do then now is to go to what we can call our third beginning. Now, this is a quotation from history. Uh, Edward Gibbon, who's probably known by name to you all, and certainly the, the term Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, 1776, etc., he wrote it. Now, this is what he says, looking at these things. He says, The ancient and popular doctrine of the millennium was intimately connected with the second coming of Christ. Yes, well, we've seen that in, in both the 16th century and in what the disciples said. It appears, the, uh, these Historian says, to have been the reigning sentiment of the orthodox believers. In other words, that's what initially they were looking for, to a kingdom to come and Jesus Christ to return. That's what they were looking for. He goes on to say, it appears to have been the reigning sentiment, but when the edifice of the church was almost completed, the temporary support was laid aside. So as the church started dominating things, what, what we, the, the historian is saying is in general people stopped thinking that Jesus Christ was going to come back and they, they turned to the things happening in the church and saw God's intervention by that way. The edifice of the church was almost completed. The temporary support, i.e. the thought of Jesus Christ coming back in his kingdom, was laid aside. That's what the historian says. And finally, that the doctrine of Christ's reign upon earth was at first treated as a profane allegory, was considered by degrees as a doubtful and useless opinion, and was at length rejected as the absurd invention of heresy. So the historian says that's what happened to it. So that as time went on, and I might say that we will look in a minute at a man called Augustine, Saint Augustine, who was uh, very much to do with this. And this question of allegory, which means to say it's something that you've got to interpret. There's an extra meaning. It doesn't mean just what it says. You've got to interpret. And then underneath there'll be something else. So when it, uh, uh, what Augustine said, it, it doesn't mean to say Jesus is actually coming back. You've got to look for it. 
in other places. So that's what had happened in the, in the not too far distant past as far as the, this was concerned. So why was, was this long established teaching about the kingdom of God being set on, on earth gradually discarded? Well, as I said, in his seminal work entitled City of God, Augustine held at his time, that's about 350 to 400 AD, he held that the millennium itself was already taking place on earth. <coughs> that, that was his saying. That, no, it's not going to come because it's already here. The kingdom of God was already manifest in the church. The church is the kingdom of God. <coughs> and he says it was marked by the ever-increasing influence of the church in overturning evil. So, you see what he's saying, that, that with the church which is there, and, and all the clergy and all the services and so on, that has replaced, as the historian has recorded that it did, that has replaced. And, that the kingdom of God, therefore, what do they do with the kingdom of God? Um, it was already present, which, they, which uh, Augustine held was from the birth of Jesus Christ, that was the millennium. So as soon as Jesus was born, and from then onwards, that was the millennium. So, on the basis of those thoughts that we've had already, the commandment, for example, to restore and to build Jerusalem, is to be treated as an allegory. It doesn't mean Jerusalem and restored or anything like that. There's a hidden meaning, it's got to be interpreted, and, and the people in the church can tell you what it means, but it doesn't mean what it says. And that was the big thing. Uh, and you might say, well, that's quite a long time ago. And it was in terms of the, uh, of the historian Gibbon's comments. But I can bring you up now to something much closer, in something like 1968, because you will possibly remember the church put out a, a report which was called The Church and the Bomb, where they considered what the church's aspect should be to do uh, together with the hydrogen bomb. And this is their point here. And you notice how they're picking up exactly the, that Augustinian view of things. And this is a direct, direct uh, quote from that book. Paul, too, believed, believed that the trumpet would sound at any moment and that the end of the ages would dawn. But the writer said, but, of course, the world did not pass away as expected and the early church had to come to terms with the mistakenness of its belief that it would do so. And so in doing that, they, they quickly go over and uh, recapitulate what had been uh, arrived at as far as the overall curse was concerned. But the people of Cromwell's time, and many of them, in reading what it said in the Bible, they were looking at things like this. And these are actual verses used by Cromwell in supporting what his view was. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and you would not. He didn't see that as, as something that had to be interpreted. He was, he was looking forward to that. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth until ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. These are all things that these people were looking at and saying, Oh, no, I, I, I don't accept what we're being told. That these are just just parables. This is actual things that they were looking forward to. And so, time is going, and I've just done a, a quick little view through this. Uh, final view of the character of Cromwell. He was very ill in the last few years of life, and uh, September the 3rd, 1658, Cromwell dies, as I've said reportedly, of this disease of malaria. So, Finally, what are we to say about Cromwell's expectation and the Jews? That's our subject. Overall, Cromwell did as much as any English leader. He looked forward to the second coming. But his commonwealth collapsed after his death. An intensely religious man, a self-styled Puritan, he called himself a second Moses. He fervently believed God was guiding his victories. He strongly favoured religious tolerance for all the various uh, Protestant groups. And so we could perhaps summarise what was said in a few minutes, he was largely a good man, but misguided in his expectation of the return of Christ, uh, because he, he didn't have a, a, a basis 
who was looking at the scriptures, he wanted to know what it was. He, think, he thought things were wrong. He was wanting to put the country right. He was wanting to give everybody a chance uh, to have their own conscience. Uh, but he was misguided in his expectation of the time. He really thought that they were just on it. And of course, at that time, Jesus didn't return. It's one of those things that people say, well, there you are, he didn't return. So, so that's the end of that. But in our advertising, we said about not only Oliver Cromwell and the Jews, but the continuing importance for us today. It's because the Christadelphians also on the situation that some of those people were on in those days, because we are confidently expecting the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and the setting up of the kingdom on earth. We don't know when that will be, but it is some, a, a real expectation that we have. So one's got to ask the question, well, might we, like Oliver Cromwell, be wrong? Well, the first thing, at least if we are prepared for the return, that must be a step forward. Um, but what we have is fulfilled prophecy, which we look at, which gives further conviction. And which, although it was available at the time of, of Cromwell, they seem to take very little notice about at all. But two particular points cannot be gainsaid. You see, AD 70 saw the overturning of Jerusalem, which was a major effect. Uh, on the world scene and that was foretold in the Bible so, so that tells us well it, it isn't all just a story with something else there was an actual event which took place and the second thing was that the state of Israel has been proclaimed now these are two monumental things that we are able to look back on that if they'd had their eyes open certainly the first one they wouldn't have seen the second one but in AD 70 there was a tremendous Roman invasion and there was uh, very much suffering and so on took place and Jerusalem and the, Jew the Jews were expelled uh, from Jerusalem in that AD 70. A time when throughout the city people were dying of hunger in large numbers and enduring unspeakable suffering. Something like two million people died at that time. But the scriptures had foretold that that would happen. And again, Jesus' words about the Jews, he said, For there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. They shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, that has actually happened. Jerusalem has been trodden down, AD 70, and all this many centuries since. So, I'm answering the question, well, perhaps we're wrong in expecting it to happen anyway. And I'm saying, well, we have got solid basis there for saying that these things are actually happening. And the second point, the prophecy to Israel. You see, Jeremiah says, I am with thee to save thee about Israel, though I make a full end of all nations, with that I have scattered thee, yet I will not make a full end of thee. They shall be carried to Babylon, and there they shall be until the day that I visit them, saith the Lord. Then will I bring them up and restore them to this place. And there's that word again about the Jews going to be restored to this place. That's what's going to happen. The Jews, the prophet says, are going to go back to their own land. I will bring them out from the peoples, gather them from the countries, and will bring them to their own land and will feed them upon the mountains of Israel. My dear friends, they are in their own land now. This is a fulfilment which Oliver Cromwell did not see. The fulfilment of Bible prophecy. The ships in 1948 bringing back Jews back into Israel. The state of Israel born by all the newspaper headlines. And we are familiar with these things. So we know that we are in an ascending time about prophecy, that the Bible is being fulfilled, that it's, we know it's just, just not a series of parables, they're actual events which are taking place. And so therefore, at this point in time, we can say, okay, well, what's going to happen in the future then? Well, here you are. What's going to happen is that when Israel is dwelling safely in their land, which they have yet to be, but they are, it's looking a little bit more hopeful now, when they're dwelling safely, the prophet says, thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. So there's going to be an invasion. So we've been reporting up to now what has happened, and we said we can see and monitor through those events. But now we're saying, well, this is what's yet to happen. We don't know precisely when, 
but we're in the last days when it will. And there's a northern invader whom we believe was going to be Russia coming up and making a large assault on Israel who but at that time will be in peace. Thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. But at that time the Lord Jesus Christ is going to intervene as that same chapter in Ezekiel says it shall come to pass at the same time when God shall come against the land of Israel saith the Lord God that my fury shall come up in my face for in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel these are future clear and specified events which are yet to be and we can watch the, the outcome and the development of these things in the various news headlines. God has a purpose with Israel. And as he says in the 34th chapter, they shall no more be a prey to the heathen, because the Jews have been a prey all their lives. Wherever they've been, they've been a prey to others. And Ezekiel says they shall no more be a prey to the heathen. Also the prophet Joel proclaims, there shall no strangers pass through her anymore. She'll be in her land and, and agree where she's going to be. And how is that going to be accomplished? It's going to be accomplished by the coming again of the Lord Jesus Christ. That very thing that Oliver Cromwell and all of those people who are anxiously looking at the scriptures, they were right at just the wrong time. There's going to come the, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, Paul says, Unto you who are troubled, rest, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints, and to be admired in all them that believe. So you're right to say, well, perhaps you're going to be wrong. Well, we, none of us know that. But what we have got is this wonderful background of clear and fulfilled scripture and the ability to look forward and see how things are developing. And therefore, hopefully, by thinking about the return of Jesus Christ and, and what he wants of his servants, to try to live lives in accordance with what he would want us to be, which was what? Oliver Cromwell and others were trying to do in, in giving people other opportunities and in trying to bring forth roots in their own lives. We've got that opportunity. If we can see these things potentially going to happen, then that means that Jesus could come at any moment. And therefore, we need to be ready for him when he shall come to be glorified. But we have to be ascent, we have got to be associated with him in the way that he's asked us. Because in the book of Mark, Jesus said unto them, Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Remember we might notice that at the beginning. Preach the gospel of the kingdom of God coming. Tell people. And that's what we're trying to do today. To tell you that these things are happening, to give you an opportunity to bring your life and to commit yourself in the waters of baptism in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. So when he comes, you'll be one of those who he will select to be with him. He that believeth and is baptised shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. And so that's the opportunity. We've looked at Oliver Cromwell, we've looked at his battles and things on this earth, we've looked at the, the problems that went on with the king and, and of what their expectations were. We've ex examined what the scripture says about the coming of the kingdom of God. And then we've looked at latter days and what's happening and what we can expect to happen. And the conclusion of all those things is that we are very close to the end time when Jesus Christ is going to return. And it's up to everyone who hears these things to look at them very, very carefully and to make up their minds whether they are living a sort of life uh, that will be acceptable to the Lord Jesus Christ when he does come. Thank you.